Hi, welcome to our channel. We're here today looking at two brand new cameras from Canon. This is the EOS R1. It's a high speed sports and action camera. And the EOS R5 Mark II. And this is a higher resolution camera, but still with lots of incredibly advanced autofocus technologies on board and high speed shooting. These two cameras actually have a lot in common. So what we're gonna look at today is what are the differences, what are the similarities, and which one might be best for you. So first of all, let's just take a quick look at the EOS R1 and see what its main features are. So this is built around a 24 megapixels stacked BSI CMOS sensor. It's capable of shooting at 40 frames per second in RAW, and it can record 6K video at 60 frames per second, or 4K at 120 frames per second. So there's a lot of capability on board there. So now let's have a look at the EOS R5 Mark II. This is high resolution, this is 45 megapixels, like the original EOS R5, and it can shoot at 30 frames per second. And it's capable of 8K video recording at 60 frames a second. So it's a higher resolution camera in a smaller body, but the two actually share a lot of their other systems. So both cameras are based around an architecture that Canon calls accelerated capture. And here we have the Digic Accelerator processor, which pairs up with the Digic X processor that has been used in previous Canon cameras. And this is the fulcrum of how these cameras work. Together with AI deep learning technology, it allows them to use a whole suite of new tools based around autofocus, tracking, subject recognition, and some really clever new features that we'll now look at in more detail. So for autofocus, these cameras both use an evolution of Canon's dual pixel AF technology, and it's now called dual pixel accelerated AF because of the new accelerator processor. And as before, every single photo site on the center is split into two, and this allows every single pixel to be used for autofocus. But now, some of those pixels are split the other way around, twisted by 90 degrees, if you like. And this allows cross-type focusing. It means the camera can recognize both horizontal and vertical detail. And that's a step change above pretty much any other camera on the market, aside from the OM1 from OM system, which has got quad pixel AF. So there's another big change on the EOS R1 sensor, particularly compared to the EOS R3, and that is it has a new optical low-pass filter. Now, previously the optical low-pass filter slightly blurs, blurs the image by splitting it four ways. And this provides protection against Murray, but it does make the image a bit less sharp. This now has a new design of optical low-pass filter that splits that image 16 ways. And according to Canon, this means you get the sharpness of a sensor which has no low pass filter, but you also suppress Murray. So that potentially is really clever. And we'll have to have a look at the image quality in practice to see how it works. So as before, both cameras autofocus systems are based around subject detection, based on AI deep learning technology. And this means they can recognize and specifically focus on humans, animals, planes, and insects and so on. And this is really clever. But Canon has now taken this a step further at least for certain circumstances, with a new concept called action priority. Now this is for sports, and what it can do for certain sports, soccer, basketball, and volleyball, it will follow the movement of the ball, work out which player has the ball, and focus on that player. So rather than having to try and follow which player has the ball using a joystick, or using some kind of movement of the focus point, the camera will just automatically work out which player is the peak of the action. Now I've just been trying this out, photographing basketball, and it really does work. It's surprisingly clever. It's not perfect, but it's a huge advance over other AF systems that I've tried for this kind of situation. When you have players who are constantly being blocked, the line of sight is moving, it still understands they should be the centre of attention, they've got the ball, and they're the one to focus on. So ordinarily the camera will quite often just drop out of focus if another player comes across in front of it in its standard mode. But when we switch on action priority, it now holds the attention, its attention on the player so much better. 
Now, the other thing about these cameras is that both also have eye control autofocus. Now, we saw this on the EOS R3, and it's actually quite an old technology. It used to be on Canon's EOS film cameras in the 1990s, and it understands where you're looking in the viewfinder and focuses around that area that you're looking at. But the way it works with these cameras is in tandem with the subject detection. So it's best seen as a means of choosing between multiple detected subjects in the frame. If you've got, for instance, four cars when you're motor racing and you want to look at the one that's not in front, but maybe the second one, all you have to do is look at that car in the viewfinder and the camera will switch the de autofocus to follow that car. It's really clever. It's a really good way of using subject detection with multiple subjects. So I haven't had a huge amount of time to work out how well it works in these cameras yet, but I have tried it on the EOS R1 and on the EOS R5 Mark II. It's really simple to calibrate and it seemed to follow the motion of my eyeball really, really well. I mean, probably best than I remember the R3 doing. So now let's have a look at some of Canon's new deep learning technologies because these are very clever, very interesting. We have, first of all, an in-camera denoise feature. And this is kind of similar to what we've seen in a lot of raw conversion software, things like DxO Pure Raw, where the camera can understand what the image should look like at high ISO and produce a denoised image with much higher detail. Now, you don't get this while you're shooting. It's only something that you get when you convert raw images in camera. But in principle, you can produce much cleaner and more detailed images when you do that. You've also got in-camera upscaling. Now, that might not be necessarily hugely useful when you've got a 45 megapixel camera to begin with. But on the 24 megapixel EOS R1, it starts to look really clever because what you can do is crop into a picture and then when you tell the camera to output that, you can get it to produce an upscaled version by a factor of two in each direction. And that gives you just that more resolution to send out to your picture desk or just to use when you're printing. Now again, this is something that we'll need to look into, how well it works. Canon making quite grand claims about it producing higher quality than merely upsampling. And so it'll be interesting to see how that really works in practice. So you can also use this just to convert your picture to different aspect ratios if you like. Rather than cropping deeply in, you can just go from three to two, switch to portrait format from a landscape picture, for instance, and then when you output that, you just tell it to upscale and you'll get more detail than you would if you just simply cropped in. Both these cameras are capable of shooting really fast. And in particular, the EOS R1, you can go at 40 frames a second. And if you shoot at those kind of speeds, you just end up with a ridiculous number of pictures to try and sort your way through. Now, one thing that Canon has done, again using deep learning, which potentially helps you on this, is that it can go through all of those pictures and detect ones that are blurred. And then those that are blurred, you can mark and tell, say that you're not going to use them. But you can also get the camera just to delete all of those automatically. So if you're confident in what it does, you can actually do a pre-filter of all of your images and get rid of a load of the ones you don't want very easily and quickly. And if you're shooting at 40 frames a second and shooting multi-second bursts, that might be a very, very useful thing to have. Now, the other thing these cameras can do, you don't have to shoot at ultra high speeds all the time. These are the first cameras for Canon that allow you to assign burst rates to a function button. And this means that you can, for instance, be shooting at 20 frames a second or 10 frames a second as standard. But then by just by pressing a button, you can switch up to high speeds and then you can toggle back down again when you're done. And again, this means that you don't have to shoot at super high frame rates all the time, but you can just temporarily switch up at the peak of the action. And another thing that Canon are now offering with these cameras is a Lightroom plugin that essentially ports the best bits of digital photography professional, which is Canon's raw processing software, into Lightroom so that you can get the image quality associated with DPP and particularly this new AI denoising but you get all of the workflow benefits of sticking with your totally established Lightroom system that you know how to work with and that you'll probably be using for years. So the OSR5 is a camera that kind of wanted to push as a hybrid camera that's also very heavily aimed at video shooters. And the R5 Mark II takes us a step further. I mean, there's a mind-boggling array of video specifications to this, but we'll just look at the headline output. And so we've got 8K at 60 frames a second, that's impressive on its own. We can record 4K at 120 frames per second, 
with audio, and that means you can do your slow motion while maintaining audio. And it can do full HD at 240 frames a second. So that's a really impressive set of video specs. And then on the EOS R1, we've got 6K at 60 frames per second. And for a camera that's supposed to be for sports photography, that's not bad going. So another brand new feature that Canon is offering is stills and video, simultaneous recording. And this allows you to shoot stills while you're recording video. You shoot your stills to one card and your video to the other. Now it's a bit limited in the resolutions that you can choose. You can only shoot in full HD video and you're somewhat limited in how you can shoot the JPEGs as well. Both have to use the same shutter speed. But it is a new feature that gives you extra capabilities. It's probably going to be most useful for photojournalism, for people who want to record snippets of video, but also shoot stills at the same time when they're shooting an event. But it's definitely a new feature that you don't get in other cameras, which sets these apart. Now, one big difference between these two cameras is the viewfinder. The EOS R1 has got an extraordinary viewfinder. It's 9.44 million dots and 0.9 times magnification. That matches all of the latest Sony cameras. We imagine it's probably going to be the same panel, effectively. And Canon says it's built a whole new system in to minimize fogging. And so you have this huge eye cup around it to prevent stray light from getting in and to make the eye control focus work. This really is an incredibly bright, beautiful, fluid viewfinder. It's one of those ones you have to look through to believe. Now, the EOS R5 Mark II's viewfinder isn't quite as amazing, but it's still very good indeed. It's 5.76 million dot resolution. It's 0.74 times magnification, and it's still really good to look through, really usable. Both viewfinders can now be switched to a blackout free shooting mode. That means that while you're continuous shooting, you just see the live view feed without interruption. You still get a little flickering outline around the edge of the frame to show you what's going on, but you don't get those black frames superimposed that break up the action and make it difficult for you to follow the motion. Both cameras have pretty much the same in-body image stabilization system. And now we have a new standard that's been introduced by SEPA for 2024. And this talks about not just the stabilization effect in the center of the frame, but also at the corners where it's often less. And both of these cameras are rated for 8.5 stops in the center and 7.5 stops towards the edge. And that's a really high level of stabilization. And we've seen it before on Canon's full frame cameras. They are very, very effective. They let you hand, shoot handheld at really slow shutter speeds and also record very smooth movie without having to use a gimbal or a tripod. So some other nice new features, both cameras have got a tally light on the front, that's just here, that'll light up red when the camera is recording, so that's great for your subject standing in front of the camera, they know what's going on. You also get a red outline on the LCD screen while it's recording, which gives you that extra visual cue, particularly if you're standing in front of the camera and have got the screen flipped out facing you. Now both cameras can record RAW video, both internally and externally, but now you've got a new light RAW format in camera that promises to give you the high resolution, high detail, but at higher compression levels so that it doesn't take up as much space. Both cameras have got a full-size HDMI port on the side and that's great because it means you don't have cables falling out. It's just so much nicer than micro or mini HDMI cables which are always a nightmare to manage. And a nice thing about how Canon has designed these ports as well is that the uh, headphone and microphone ports are well out of the way of the articulated screen so you can put your microphone on and you can monitor audio but still be able to twist the screen to any angle. Both cameras have got a heat dissipating structure built in. So the EOS R5, the original model, was infamously prone to overheating. And Canon have now built a new structure in. So you have a little vent in the bottom of the camera and a cooling path of air coming through and out the side. And you can actually get a cooling grip for this that's got a fan built into it that will blow air through this to cool the camera. And that allows extended video recording times compared to just using the camera on its own. The EOS R1 has also got a heat dissipating structure, but because you've got a bigger body and just that much more space to dissipate heat, it can record huge long extended recording times all on its own. So Canon considers these both to be professional cameras. We no longer have a distinction of the R5 considered a slightly lower level. And what that means they have weather sealed construction, magnesium alloy frames, they just both feel really well made. 
I mean, the R1 just feels completely bomb-proof. The R5 has got slightly smaller buttons, doesn't feel quite as great, but you would still trust that in pretty much any conditions. And another really nice feature on the R1, which sounds like it doesn't really mean very much, but it matters when you start shooting, is you've got this new texture to the grip, and it's just incredibly grippy. It means that you shouldn't have this camera slipping out of your hands. And that's great if you're a sports photographer handling it in wet or cold conditions. It just gives that added surety that you've got this camera and it's not going to go anywhere. So what about pricing? Well, we don't have final numbers at the moment. We'll put them up on screen. But our understanding is that the EOS R5 Mark II will cost £4,500. That's pretty much the same as the original R5. That's very aggressive pricing given how much improvement it's got. And then the EOS R1 will cost £7,100, there or thereabouts. And again, that's a quite high price for this kind of camera. It's higher than the Sony Alpha 9 II. It's higher than the Nikon Z9, but it has got quite a lot of technologies on board that Canon will probably tell you make up for that, particularly such things as the eye control focus and the clever new autofocus systems. So we've had a bit of time to use both cameras now, and I've got to say I have been impressed by both of them. They handle extremely well. They're both remarkably quick. Canon's new autofocus system is one of those things that I think you have to use to realize that it is a big step up. It may not sound much on paper, but the stickiness of the tracking, the clever new action priority modes if you shoot sport, these are actually really useful things to have. And it just feels incredibly refined, incredibly quick. Both cameras are really nice in your hands. They have similar control layouts, so you'd be able to switch between the two fairly easily. They're both really nice to shoot with. And the thing as well is that Canon hasn't messed with a, any kind of winning formula here. You've got pretty much the same control layout as you had on the R5 on this one. You've got a few detail changes. The power switch has moved over to the to your right hand side which makes it much easier to get at and then on the other side you've got a stills video selector switch that's a nice update and then the r1 is very similar to the r3 and this means if you already use these canon cameras there's very little you need to adapt to they work in pretty much exactly the same way as you're used to so which of these two should you buy well I think it's fairly self-evident you've got distinctly different use cases here. This is the camera to choose if you want to do high-end sports and action or maybe wildlife. This is the camera that is incredibly rugged, it's got huge stamina. It will work really, really well with long lenses. You've got the built-in vertical grip. And if that's all the sort of stuff that you value and you can afford the price tag, then that obviously is the one for you. For most people, most photographers, probably the R5 Mark II is going to be the one to pick. It's got incredible video capabilities as well, but it's also got high stills resolution. It's very fast. You've got the smaller body. It is an incredibly accomplished all-round camera from our initial impressions of using it. And so that will probably be the one for most people. So what do you think? Which of these cameras would be for you? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe.